we're going to kick off today with a really fantastic speaker. In fact, he's back by popular demand. Um, he did a really great job next year that, that we just had to get him back again this year. Uh, Dr. Stephen Kinsella is the Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Limerick in Ireland and a research fellow at the University of Melbourne. In fact, He's just wrapped up a year-long sabbatical in Australia, and in this session, he is going to reflect on what he's learned about Australia, our investment landscape, and of course, the super sector as well. I'm going to invite Dr. Kinsella onto the stage in just a moment, but in terms of the format, a reminder, he will be speaking, uh, um, doing a presentation for about half an hour, and at the end of it, we'll have a Q&A session. And as always, please use the app um, to ask any questions, and of course, you can rate the session We'd love to hear from you. But ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dr. Stephen Kinsella. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Um, is there anybody in here called John? <laughs> hands up. Congratulations, John. You're the next Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> you'll, you'll, take, uh, you'll take office in a couple of weeks. Just give it some time. Get some business cards printed up. You'll be grand. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for having me here um, again. I, I've had an amazing year in Australia. I'm convinced this is one of the greatest countries on earth. Um, and I have, uh, uh, my, my kids have been here and they, they've really enjoyed themselves. So what you're going to see now is half an hour of me on my holidays. That's <laughs> um, going to be great. I'm excited to show you the, the many, many pictures of me on a camel. But, uh, uh, quite seriously, uh, what have I learned? And I, 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 I'm, I'm really grateful to the organizers of this conference because they, they said, would you, would you spend some time thinking about what it is you've actually learned from being in Australia? Um, the many, many ways to say the word, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. All those different ways. But I boiled it all down and this is what it is. So it's early in the morning. It's early in the morning if, you're, if, you, if you feel like turning off for a little bit, that's totally cool. But just maybe write this down. This is what I've learned about Australia. This is the roots of its success. This is where most of the risk with respect to the economy of Australia is going to come from. And this is where all the opportunities are going to come from as well. Openness and resources. Australia equals openness and resources. So that's what I know in answer to the question that the organizers posed me. And what do I mean by openness and resources? Openness to people, ideas, and capital. Australia has done really, really, really well where they've let people in. Not the right people, just people, because they never know what people can do. Ideas, one of the biggest foundations of Australia's success is its world-class higher education sector. And capital, we need to get that money. Get money is great, and you guys are very good at it. Very, very, very good at it. Um, and then, of course, resources of people, ideas, and capital. Uh, and I think what's important to understand about this is how these things interact, okay? Openness and resources. So let's start with openness. In a little while, you're gonna get a question uh, uh, for a poll, so I hope, uh, and it's about workers and wages, so I hope you'll uh, spend some time in thinking a, a little bit about that with me, and then we can have a chat about it later. So, I get really, really worried when I made this chart. I know it's early in the morning, uh, and don't worry, some of the stuff might be a little bit depressing, but I will take you into Mordor and back out to the Shire again, don't worry, it'll be grand. It really will. By the way, uh, that, that joke gets less and less laughs over time. I don't know why. Not in New Zealand, though. It blows up. So, um, <laughs> because of the many tax breaks. So, uh, what you're looking at is the ratio of world trade growth to GDP growth. So, when GDP, obviously, is an imperfect measure, but it's a measure of how much how, of the wealth, if you like, of the income that's, that, that, that's uh, produced in a society in a given year. Um, and when trade is growing faster than GDP, we can really think about that as reflecting more globalization. When I say globalization, I mean the increased interconnection of markets. So the market, markets for canned tomatoes in Cairns are affected by what happens in China. They are affected by what happens in America. That's what that means. The market for skilled labor. 
uh, um, I'm not going to count economists amongst skilled labor. Uh, your visa system doesn't. But uh, no, it really, it doesn't. <laughs> it's really funny, actually. Uh, I'm here as a researcher. Yeah, you have too many economists. You don't need any more. So um, here I am taking a job. The, the, uh, the, the basic idea here is that the ratio of world trade growth to GDP growth has been below its trend growth now for nearly nine years. That means we are in a period of deglobalization. And there's no way to get around that, right? The long term median growth is 1.62%, the average growth is 1.81%. So we're well below where we could be or should be. Now, now you should expect a period of retrenchment after the, the, the GFC. Um, you should expect a period of retrenchment after that. But you have to remember, in all of this, that China has been growing immensely over this period. Were it not for China's growth, this line would be far worse. So we're in a period of, 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 of extreme exceptionalism when it comes to globalization. I think it's starting to look really, really clear that uh, 2008, 2009 was the high point of the second great wave of globalization. The first great wave uh, uh, obviously ended in 1914 with the First World War. The second great wave started after the Second World War and probably ended with the global financial crisis. The question is now, what replaces it? Um, and of course, for, for, for Australia, remember, the, the foundations of Australia's prosperity are openness and resources. And that openness is threatened by this. So a key policy problem for Australia into the future is how to deal with these issues, how to grow, how to thrive, how to survive in these uh, less salubrious times. Now, this is a, a chart I love to make. Um, what you're looking at is the percentage of world GDP. So this is 2016 world GDP. In 2016, the world produced $120 trillion worth of stuff, US dollars worth of stuff, and of that, China uh, produced about 18% of it, the US produced about 16% of it, India, Japan, Germany, Russia, Brazil, Indonesia. You can see Australia is just there, it's just slightly under 1% of world GDP, um, 0.98 actually. And what's really interesting about that is that's about less than 1% of world GDP is how one would define a small open economy. So is Australia a small open economy? Hands up who thinks Australia is a small open economy, i.e. that it's unable to influence the world interest rate. Whoa, everyone in the room thinks you're a small open economy. Well, I just it took, took me three and a half hours to fly up here. <laughs> you're not that small geographically. There's now 25 million people here, um, a third of whom weren't born here. And it's a really, really interesting time to be thinking about this stuff. Understanding Australia's place in the world as a small open economy tells you exactly what you need to do in terms of thinking about how it thrives. It thrives by being uh, open to trade, but, not, but, but also by uh, innovating in terms of high value industrial goods, and high value services. You probably all know Australia is, this, is the world's uh, there, there are basically two main exporters of services in the world, the United States and Australia. That's it. You, you're, you, you produce more uh, services by, as a percentage of, of GDP than almost anywhere else on Earth. Uh, and the super industry is actually a large part of uh, why that is. Okay, and there's Australia there. And what, what's interesting about this figure to me is that I think a lot of people tend to think of Australia as actually smaller than it is. It's really interesting. I, I would have always assumed that Australians thought their, 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 their country was bigger than it is economically. No, you actually think it's smaller the more I talk to people. And it's not. It's quite a big, quite a big economy. Um, I'm not even going to try to point out where Ireland is. You know? Now, if this was a chart of banter, we'd be up on top, the pair of us. <laughs> Ireland and Australia would just be banter. One, banter two. The UK would be a very distant second. <laughs> very, very distant. Maybe third. You know. No deal is a bad deal. So this is the percentage of world population, the 7.3 billion people in the world uh, right now, roughly something like that. Um, Australia is down there. Very, very, uh, 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 it's a different chart really, isn't it? There's China, there's India, there's, there's the US, Indonesia, Brazil, and so forth. But you can see in terms of the tiers, there's maybe one, two, three, four, five, fifth tier into this stream up in terms of its uh, global ranking. And I think that tells you something. 
that tells you something really, really important about uh, Australia. Okay. So, uh, one of the things I really wanted to do was to think about Australia's place in the world with this talk. So what I've done is I went through the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, basically the club of the rich countries. Um, they love doing these kinds of rankings. There's 39 countries in, in each rank. And here's what, how Australia ranks. Uh, out of 39, uh, for education spending, and this is combined primary, secondary, and tertiary education, uh, you, you're about 14th out of 39. Your outcome in terms of maths, you're about 19th out of 39. So you, for, in terms of your spend, you spend a lot, do you, get, do, do, you get a, do you get a good education system out of it? I would argue, yes, absolutely you do. It's not focused on tests as much as the other systems, but you know what? It's actually really, really uh, good, and I've got three kids in a primary school in, in, in North Melbourne. I can tell you right now, pretty great experience. Uh, income inequality, 15th out of 39. Not great, not too bad either, but as I'm going to show you, income inequality is, is a very complicated thing. Household debt, fourth in the OECD for household debt. This should worry you, especially if any of you have any. Do you, does anybody here have any debt? <laughs> People are like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, uh, we might come back to that later. <laughs> I hope the mic picked up the laughter. People are like, <laughs> yeah, debt, yay. Fifth, fifth, for o, fifth for CO2 emissions. Fifth out of 39, you produce a lot of CO2 here. Um, government debt, 21st, not too bad. Not too bad at all, that may change, but it's not too bad. Disposable income, uh, 22nd. You don't have as much disposable income as you think you have. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, and now, and now the, the big one, and we'll have a poll question about this in a little while. You are 38th out of 39 for the growth of labor compensation. The only country that paid its workers less was Greece. Hmm? There are no workers there. Well, there, there are no workers there. <laughs> well, I've been in Greece. I've been in Greece. The, the commenters said there, there are no workers there. I've, I've, I've been in Greece, and uh, the uh, average Greek person actually works more hours than the average German. Uh, they're, 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 where there are jobs, there are hard workers and people who, who do that. I've produced uh, uh, some PhD students that are now working in the Greek Ministry for Finance. I'm very proud of them. Um, and uh, hopefully, now that they've left the bailout, they'll be able to, to, to do things. Um, but yes, labor compensation, 38 out of 39. Um, the interaction of debt and wages in this economy is something we're going to come back to. Unit labor costs, you're fourth, so not too bad. And multi-factor productivity, you're sixth. So you're very productive, hard-working people who are producing a lot of stuff and not getting paid for it. What's that about? Okay. This chart is something called the Economic Complexity Index. Don't worry, I'm not going to beat you over the head with charts for too, too much longer. And what, you, what, what this is, this is, this is constructed by, some, by something called the Atlas of Economic Complexity at MIT. So if you produce corn, that's not a particularly complex product to produce. And it, but if you produce tinned, tinned corn, that's slightly more complex to produce because you need you know, a process manufacturer and, uh, and a factory and all that kind of stuff. And if we produce you know, emojis of corn, for phones and stuff, that's a lot more complex to make, a lot less useful to eat, but a lot more complex to make. So you move up that complexity index. So what you should see is that's uh, 1965, Ireland's at the top. Why? Because Ireland has always done light manufacturing. It's not just the crack um, there that we do. Uh, a lot of, a lot, Ireland has always done light manufacturing, and we've always been very successful at doing it. What you can see in Australia is that the economic complexity index has fallen in this country. It has fallen precipitously uh, over this period. Um, and you, know, you, 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 can see, you can see, for example, a country like Saudi Arabia, at the very bottom, it got worse, and then it got a lot better, and it's uh, plateaued, because it basically produces one or two products. Okay, so, that, so the story of Australia as being, a continue, as being close to the technological frontier is probably true in sectors like financial services, but it's probably not true in other areas. That means there's a huge, huge opportunity. You could move that red line up to the top there. You could change the lives of millions of people if you did that. Changing 
what you produce, who you sell to, and everything else. That's an incredibly, incredibly big opportunity here. And I see it every day um, um, uh, uh, at the University of Melbourne. So that's the first part, openness. You've got to be open to the world. The more open you are, the better you will be. You also have to figure out how to use your resources. People, ideas, capital. Okay. So when we think about resources, um, and this is something I, I've been working on with uh, Stephen Anthony from the Industry Super Fund. We're building a model of the Australian economy based on some work that I did for the Bank of England two years ago. Um, and we should be able to uh, talk about that publicly in maybe three or four weeks. Um, I was too busy on my holidays to finish the model. It is genuinely my problem. Uh, so we think about it like this. This is, uh, as many of you will know, this is the structure of the uh, national system of national accounts. You've got households, the government, non-financial corporates, so think like coffee stops and, uh, uh, and things like that, financial corporates, you guys, and the rest of the world. Okay? So this is, a, this is a really good model to think about uh, openness and resources. So think about household debt. Fourth in the OECD. Think about government debt, you know, well down in the mid 20s. Non financial corporates, have they got a lot of debt? Not really, actually, relative to the operating surplus of the non financial corporates. They're doing pretty well for themselves. They're all right. Financial corporates, some worries there, as I'll show you. And then the rest of the world. The, the, when you look at the, the mining industry, you look at uh, Western Australia, you look at, you look at different parts of this economy, what you see is that different uses and different resources are, are being uh, implemented at different times. And this has buoyed the economy at particular points. When the household sector couldn't do the growing, the mining sector did the growing. When, when uh, one region wasn't doing so well, another region you know, kept up. When you've got a period of deindustrialization in Victoria, for example, ca car factories leaving and so forth, other, other sectors pick up and keep it going. And it's one of the major, major, major benefits about this uh, economy. And so when we think about this, when we think about this, we have to understand that all of these things are connected. They're connected to each other, okay? Super funds thrive when workers are getting paid more. Uh, it's something I'm gonna come back to at the very end of this talk. Poor people don't pay super. That's just a fact. Poor people don't pay super. If you want super industry to grow, you, gotta ha you have to find common cause with people who uh, understand how to get wages up. Okay, households, government, non-financial, financial corporates. I would argue the household sector is very stretched and very stressed at the moment. I would argue non-financial corporates have some space, but not too much. There's big risks for financial corporates, uh, uh, as we'll talk about in a little while, and the rest of the world is, is not growing as much. Okay? So a lot of it has to come down to government intervention, which it has the scope to do, and a lot of it has to come down to how these sectors interact with one another. All right, I really like this chart. <coughs> In 1999, the great economist, the late great economist, Wynne Godley, wrote an amazing paper, and it's called Seven Unsustainable Processes. If you haven't read it, Google it. It's fantastic. It's fantastic for a couple of reasons. The first is the super dodgy, late 90s Microsoft Word formatting. It's just like, it looks like a child put it together. It's hilarious. The second thing is, and, problem, and most importantly, is the extreme uh, uh, prescience with which Wynne Godley predicted exactly when and how the US economy and the world economy would stall. Seven unsustainable processes. This paper has guided my academic work for the last 10 years um, and it has guided many people's. It's a fabulous piece of economic thinking and writing and research. And very simply, it starts with the tautology. Something that is not sustainable will stop. It sounds stupid, but it's not. Something that is not sustainable will stop. Does that look sustainable to you? This chart here is the chart of income growth and dwelling values across Australia. I've, uh, it's from CoreLogic, but they've, nice people have, there have broken it down by city, and this, the, the trends are obviously more extreme in Sydney and Melbourne, um, where I think it, it, it is, it, if there are any budding sociologists in the room, it would be really interesting to have people walk around to strangers and uh, just with a clipboard and a, t and a stopwatch and just start talking about anything and wait until it becomes about property. I think the average time is seven minutes. I have 
maybe experimented on some people. <laughs> Six and a half, really. Okay, so dwelling growth versus household income values. So this is not sustainable. It's just not. Okay? It's, it's simply not. One of those lines has to change its direction. I really, really, really hope for all of you, given how, how you laughed earlier on, that the blue line goes up. I really hope that that's where that goes. Okay, so I talked about um, fragility in, in the corporate sector. What you're looking at is the network of all the banks on earth. This is from the Bank of International Settlements and uh, an amazing uh, uh, paper by uh, a young computer scientist called Philippa Schiegel. And uh, her work shows the interbank liability network. So this is who owes who stuff. You can see the United States, you can see the United Kingdom. That's slight, that blue one that's a little bit bigger, just below the US, by the way, is Vatican City. <laughs> who knew? Who knew <laughs> that a lad who lives in a giant golden palace <laughs> had lots of money? Okay, he has lots of money. The red line, the yellow lines there, you can see Australia is over there on, on your right-hand side. And uh, what you should see is, uh, think about this as um, a rope. Think about liabilities as a rope. <clears throat> you all understand balance sheets. If there are any major macro shocks in countries like the US, Japan, to a far, far less extent, the UK. Um, Australia will feel it. And, and I think that's a really, really important thing. Historically, your financial sector has been insulated from the major crises around the world. Um, uh, largely due to the fact that your uh, institutions have been really, really, really strong. Your regulator and your central bank have been really, really, really strong in stopping that from happening. Uh, now, I know they're not your friends at the moment. I, I do get that. But uh, uh, in, large, in large respects, I, if I were you, I would be paying far more attention to the liability structure that your funds have from the rest of the world because that's where a lot of this global macro risk is coming from. Remember, we're in a period of deglobalization, so that matters a lot. Now, I think we've got a poll to ask you guys. So, <clears throat> real wage growth is wages less than, uh, uh, wages taking account of inflation. So, uh, it's not enough to get a 2% increase in your wages if inflation goes up by 3%. You're poorer in real terms. So, what do you think the chances of real wage growth exceeding 3% by 2020. So that's only two years' time, okay? What do you think? Do you think there's a chance that the average worker plucked off the street in Cairns is going to have their wages grow up in, grow by 3% in real terms by 2020? What do you guys think? I'd be really, really interested to, to, to given that you've seen the statistics on labor compensation in Australia uh, and in other places, uh, what do you think? <laughs> we were going to wait a while to see what the result was, but I don't think we need to. <laughs> That's remarkable. So, so we're, in a, we're in an audience of really savvy people, right? Really savvy, market-orientated people who really understand the Australian economy at a deep level. And 72% of you think there's less than a 5% chance of seeing 3% growth by 2020. That's remarkable. That's really, really, really interesting. Okay. Who, <laughs> there's got to be one person who's like, yeah, no, 95%. Totally going to happen. <laughs> That's just, is it you, John? The Prime Minister. Mr. Prime Minister designate. You're just like, it's going to be great, guys. It's going to be great. I'm going to lead us to victory. It's going to work out. I believe in you. I believe in you. It's going to happen. <laughs> okay. We can come back to that maybe in a little while. Thank you. That's really interesting. The chart on the left, or your right, is uh, income inequality, but it's broken down by percentile. What you're looking at is the evolution of who gets what in Australia. The first two lines are the ratio between the people at the fifth decile, so the middle middle class, and the people in the first decile, the poorest people in society. So what you're really looking at is the average person that you see taking their kids to school on a daily basis, have they been getting uh, have they begun richer or poorer over this time? And the answer is, yeah, they've been doing okay. 
um, the ratio of the ninth decile to the fifth decile. So again, these are people, the ninth decile, these are the people doing very, very well for themselves. Uh, and then it, it, they, they've been going okay. They've been getting a little bit better since the 1980s, uh, 1990s rather. I would argue the super industry has a large part to play in making that happen. But then look at the green line. The green line is these are the, these are the people who have been doing very, very well in this economy. Um, now, a question would be, if house prices fall, if there are unsustainable processes in this economy, and house prices don't do what they think you're going to do, what's going to happen to the income uh, uh, inequality statistics in Australia? They're going to go down. But the reason, so Australia will become more equal. But they won't become more equal because the people at the bottom are getting more. They'll be, it'll become more equal because the people at the top have lost. And nobody wants that. Now look at the other chart, labor productivity. This is forecast out to 2021 by the uh, OECD. Australia is an incredibly productive. You are, it's a hard chart to read a little bit, but um, that one at the top there, that orange line at the top, that's you. You're forecast to be the most productive workers in the OECD, far higher than the world average. Now recall, your forecast by 2020 was that N almost none of you, except Mr. Prime Minister designate, thinks that you're going to get a 3% wage increase. You're going to, your labor productivity is going to go up by more than 15% over that period. So, somebody's making the money. It's not Australian workers. That's bad for super funds because poor people don't pay super. Okay, one technology that exists to increase wages is, of course, unions. Australia has a particular interest in unions. Uh, in 1960, about 92% of all Australians were covered by collective bargaining or economy-wide statutory agreements. Uh, that is now just under uh, 60%. The collapse in, union, in unionization, particularly in the private sector, is a particularly big deal. Really, really interesting study by Simon Deakin uh, from Cambridge and his colleagues. They studied 113 countries for 70 years. What they showed was the major determinant of uh, a, there being a disconnect between labor productivity increases and wage increases was weakening labor market regulations. So the weaker the union is, the less workers get paid. And that's not a rich economy or a poor economy statistic. They found it's true across 113 countries over 70 years. So. Why am I standing here talking to you about unions? Here's what I would like you to do by ASI 2019. I think the super industry is common cause with the union movement. I think the super industry is common cause with anything, that, any technology that helps increase wages. Any technology that increases wages. So what I would like to see is by, by 2019, the super industry and the unions have some agreement in terms of wage growth. Now, this doesn't mean wage growth for everybody, right? That doesn't mean wage growth for everybody. I think if you're in a sector that's working hard, if you're in a sector that's producing a lot of productivity, then you should, those workers should get paid more. If you're in a, in a sector that's not being very productive, I don't think there's any particular uh, reason for them to get paid. I think you should work together to sponsor practical new initiatives to measure productivity in the service sector. We know how to measure productivity in manufacturing. We don't know how to measure productivity in services. That's a really, really positive thing that could come out of this, if, the, if, if there was a common cause there. Uh, government doesn't need to listen to unions anymore. It does need to listen to you guys. Super industry is an incredibly important part of not just the financial services architecture of this country, um, but of the economy as a whole. You're a massive part of the economy. Um, and you're also a, a part of the financial services industry that has a dual mandate. The far, first part, of course, is make money, 3% real, et cetera, et cetera. The other, other part is mind people's savings so that they have a future when they're older. And uh, the third part is obviously get paid, which you would like to do. But and if, if you want to get paid, you just have to remember poor people don't pay super. You've got to remember that. So wage growth, whatever mechanisms you can put in place to help wages increase will stop or, or, or reduce the probability of an unsustainable process taking place here. And uh, I think that's a really good place to stop. So openness and resources. Openness is 
uh, the biggest opportunity and the biggest risk. How you use your resources, in particular your workers, is probably the biggest challenge for the next uh, five to seven years. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was a really great presentation. I have a million questions. I know the audience also have quite a few questions as well. Um, just a reminder, you can send your questions through the app on your phone. Thank you to everyone who's already sent some questions through. Um, so watching your presentation, for me, the biggest takeaway and uh, the most standout figure was something I think a few members of the audience certainly share, which is this ranking of labour compensation. Uh, 38 out of 39, according to the OECD. Startling that we're the only country, apart from Greece, that pay our workers less. I've got about three questions here about that. Um, Let's start with this one. Is the ranking of labour compensation on after-tax wages, i.e. take-home take pay? If so, could that be a reflection of relative tax rates? So, uh, great question. Great question. It, it, this, is, this is gross pay, so it's before taxes. So, what you're looking at is uh, w without the taxation system being applied. Right. Many countries, for example, have a far less... Uh, sorry, have a far more progressive taxation system. In other words, they... they, they they make uh, better paid workers pay more than Australia. Um, yep. So, so the, the, the income tax system here is pretty progressive, but it's not as progressive as countries like Ireland, where you hit the top rate of tax where you, when you start earning 35 grand a year, you basically take, they take 42%, I think, mm -hmm. uh, now. Um, so the marginal rate of tax is far higher, the effective rate of tax is higher. So it's far better that you actually uh, look at gross uh, uh, um, measures of income. Um, employees' shares of corporate profits have continued to fall, and, and it's now actually quite close to the Great Depression levels. What are the risks, and how can this trend be reversed? So um, there are two. So, so when, when you when you say employee share of corporate profits, mm. uh, you, do do you mean um, uh, 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 employee share ownership, like equities? You know, I, I work for Microsoft. I have equity in Microsoft. Or do you mean labor compensation as a percentage of national income? That's a very good question. I don't know who asked that totally question. Because they're two totally different things. <laughs> but but could you could the you explain is, the yeah, two sure. in, in both those so, contexts? So, so um, yeah. in, in the in the 1980s, there there was a, a really big push to basically embed workers' incentives with managerial incentives. Mm. And the idea was, uh, Stephen will work harder if uh, the, if he has shares in the University of Limerick, if he's tied to the success of the company. Um, and that worked pretty well until workers realized that the value of shares goes down as well as up, mm. and so that, that tended to be a bit of a problem. Um, and so as far as I know, there's a very mixed picture when it comes to those things. If you happened to uh, get shares in a car company or something like that in the 1980s, you know, uh, uh, things may have worked out well for you or not. If you were, you know, if you happen to have been one of the people who got some Apple shares in the 1980s, things have gone quite well for you. Yeah. On the other part, labor compensation as a, as a percentage of national income, that was, you know, upward, that was very, very high in the 1950s. So workers took home most of what the mm -hmm. economy produced. Um, but I think it's something like 70-30 overall, according to the ILO in Australia. And uh, that was pretty true of countries like uh, uh, the UK and other places. And then slowly that's fallen, and, and, and that's fallen, and I think, um, uh, it, to a historic low now. I think it's 48% now. Mm. So uh, the, the interesting thing there is that workers, as defined, they don't just get their income from wages anymore. They get their income from super. They might also get their income from investments, you know, property investments and things like that. Yeah. So it's, it's a murkier picture, but, the, but the, the, the truth about it is that the biggest risk is if there's any kind of shock, there's no buffer to yeah. meet it. That's the biggest thing. Do you, you know what, in addition to the ranking of labour compensation, I think it's the double whammy of the fact that we not only have low wage growth and we're not paying our workers enough, but we're also one of the most productive countries in the world. Again, a point that I resonated with me and quite a few people in the audience. Um, a question here, productivity through technological automation works to replace labour not necessarily increase its value. Mm -hmm. How does Australia increase wages in light of this automation? That's a brilliant question. That's a brilliant question. We have a really okay. smart audience. That's so. a really, really great question. Yeah. So, so the question is, if it, what, how, or how am I supposed to, if let's say I, I work in a, 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 I own a canned goods company and I'm replacing workers with mm. um, 
with uh, the people who used to run the canning uh, factory, I'm now replacing them with automa automation. Um, or or I, I used to have call center workers and now I have AI bots. Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I increase wages? Well, one of the things, one of the things that you're going to have to do is figure out that the, the workers that remain um, are going to have a very different set of skills to the workers that you aren't hiring. Mm. Right, they very different set of skills. Much higher up the uh, much higher up the the food chain, as it were. Now, if you look at countries like Germany, when you when 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 German workers German workers not only are exposed to this automation risk, they are generating it a lot of the time. Um, um, but in Germany, the workers actually have a say about the compensation, not just the compensation levels, but the compensation culture. Uh, and that's at the sectoral level, not just the firm level. Mm -hmm. And so what, what happens is uh, nobody can, nobody can uh, uh, suggest that, that the German economy isn't a, a world leader, that it isn't mm -hmm. at the technological frontier. Um, it, in general, when new technologies come in, they do replace workers. They do replace some workers, um, but uh, uh, they also create more jobs. In the, in the last nine major technological revolutions have created more jobs than they've destroyed. Now, the question is not, will more jobs be created? Because I think the answer is yes. Yeah. The real question is, what do you do for the people who are left behind? Right? What do you do for the people who are left behind? Uh, when people move large factories out mm. of um, uh, small towns, what happens to the people who live in the small towns. Yeah. There's an amazing book um, by a guy called Michael Trebelko, T-R-E-B-I-L-C-O-C-K, uh, and it's called Dealing with the Losers. And he basically goes through a load of case studies of where jobs have been taken away because of globalization, automation, technological change. Mm -hmm. What he shows is that where people get together to actually retrain and reskill, it works quite well. Yeah. Where the idea is that the market will solve it, that doesn't work at all. That really doesn't work. Uh, it tends to fail. So I think it needs to be a government, a private sector, public sector partnership. And it's interesting that you use the example of Germany because one of the questions here is, if, if wages are so low and productivity is so high, why are all the car manufacturing plants in Australia closing down when they remain in operation in other OECD countries? And, and as you'd probably been aware, we have seen massive oh, yeah. um, you know, manufacturing close downs. And mm -hmm. Germany is a great example of, of a country that's still got that. Yeah, they still got that. And the reason that they still got that is because they invested in first off, first off, first off, and I hesitant, I'm hesitant to use the word nationalism in a German context for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is there is actually a nationalistic issue here. You have German banks and German manufacturers that were literally created after the Second World War to lift the country out of its mm -hmm. it, it, its its uh, decline. But what they've done is always invest in R and D within. The, the companies and within the university sector. And what that's really done is keep them further ahead yeah. in terms of quality. So uh, w w the, uh, the idea of uh, an Australian car company, there could be an Australian car company today. There could be an Australian car company today. I would be hesitant to say that it would run on gas, but there could be an Australian car company today. But in order to make that work, you need solar power and you need batteries. Hmm. Now, I've been across Australia. You have a lot of sunlight. <laughs> There's a lot. Look at my face. Like, I need to be aware at all times of sunlight. You guys have a lot of it. Solar power, batteries, cars. You could do it. There's no lack of expertise or brain power here. We just have a lack of policy. Hmm? We have a lack of policy on lack energy. Lack of policy. So there that, is, that is a bit of a setback. There is, it, it is yeah. probably the largest risk Mm. It is probably a policy risk. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very hesitant, by the way, as somebody who, who, who doesn't have a vote here to criticize the government that is here. I don't think it's appropriate. Mm. Um, but I, I think we all know they could probably do a bit better. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, are there any examples from other countries that have had some success in measuring productivity, but in the services sector? Yeah, so um, there's a really, really brilliant uh, initiative going on at the Brookings Institution at the moment. And what they're doing is they're sponsoring a set of initiatives to look at, how, to, look, to figure out how, how, what does it look like, you know, if people are working more mm. in, a, in, a, in the services sector? Like, if you're a barista and you're producing more coffees per hour, is that better or worse? In Melbourne, I don't know. I mean, they seem to produce about three coffees per hour. Yeah. You know, so 
and, and, but it's very good coffee. It turns out <laughs> this country has ruined me for coffee. I've been to other countries and it's like, this is hot brown liquid and I will not have, have it. Take it away from me. Yeah. No, uh, but to, to, to be serious, uh, the, the, the US is where, the US and particularly Silicon Valley, mm. they've really started thinking about this carefully because they need to worry about the compensation culture in their own companies. So you basically just have people sitting in front of computers, mm. right? Um, did you have those Richard Scarry books when you were a kid? So, so they're like, did you, did you, do you know what I'm talking about? The Richard There's Scarry books? There's some in the audience. People yep. are like, people yep. are nodding yeah, yeah. The enthusiastically. Yep. 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 He's like, I've got them right now. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> okay, cool. They're, they're great books because they're literally like, you know, it's like a dog that's a, that's a farmer and a cat that's a, a fireman, you know, and all this kind of stuff. The Richard, that's, the, and it was beautiful and they're beautifully illustrated and I remember them from my childhood really well. Um, if you, what would the Richard Scarry book of the last 10 years look like? It's all just dudes with, like the cat would have like a check shirt, <laughs> you know, and he'd just be sitting there with a laptop, you know, waiting 25 minutes for, for, for a cappuccino. So like, that, Which that, baristas do you go to? I, I know, no right? Idea. <laughs> they're, they're fabulous coffees, but I just keep, yeah, they're just not, I, I, I've, always, I've often think about labor productivity in terms of services, <laughs> and I'm just looking going, and it, it, it's this thing about quality. <laughs> right? right, so they are amazing coffees. Yeah, you know, but you have a beard at the end of it when you get one. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is it is interesting. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. But so so that idea about okay, there are different, there are new types of jobs, but they all kind of look the same, mm. right? So so should for example, one one idea is measuring mouse miles. So how much clicking do you do? Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. this kind of stuff. This is actually an idea that they they floated in the 1970s, um, that we could just measure. This, how, how, how many clicks do you do? Yeah. Um, of course, people would come up with ways to game the system yeah. pretty quickly, you know. <laughs> put your cat, <laughs> put the mouse on your cat and just have it run around. Um, but, but that whole idea of uh, measuring mm -hmm. what you do online is, is, is probably being done best in the US and at the Brookings Institution. In addition to the labour compensation, I think the other really key point that, that's quite worrying, it's, it's a topic that we do discuss a lot, is of course wage growth mm. and the fact that we've had stagnant wage growth. It didn't surprise me to see the poll results of 72% of the audience saying yeah. less than 5% uh, belief it will um, go to 3% in 2020. Yeah. I would have voted exactly the same way. Yeah. So a question on that, universal basal, basic income was a topic of discussion yesterday. Ah, cool. What is your view on UBI in the global and Australian context? Okay, so UBI is, is a great idea. Um, the problem with it is how do you, how do you, ha how do you incentivize people uh, to produce something? So UBI is an idea that's, that it, it, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, Victorian idea. It, it comes from, it, it, it's a really old idea. And it comes from the idea that, well, the poor are kind of useless, but we like them. <laughs> they have a vote. What should we do? Give them something. How much? Doesn't matter. Give them something. Grant. What will they do? Does it matter? No. Let them be artists or whatever. That's the, it's a very, very Victorian notion. It, ha, it, was, it was formalized um, in the 1940s. And the, again, the basic idea is people f unfettered, by, uh, unfettered by wages and unfettered by the need to you know, you know, grind out a, a living will you know, all of a sudden take to painting and poetry and art. Well, leisure time has exploded in the Western world since the 1970s. We have more free time now than at any point in our, in our past. What do we do with our free time? <laughs> Reality television is what we do with our free time. Instagram and Twitter is what we do with our free time. So if you give everybody inf infinite free time, that just means Twitter, right? Infinite Twitter forever. I think that sounds awful. Um, th there is also another idea, and it's far darker. Um, in an era where automation replaces all jobs. So, this, so again, another really H.G. Wells idea, right? It's, it's total sci-fi. Mm. You know, automation replaces all jobs. What will we do? Well, well, well you know, luck, luckily, there's, the, the, I have heard this, by the way. There, well, luckily, you know, there is an opioid academic, a, a, epidemic. And so that keeps them busy. Genuinely, I've heard that. <laughs> I have been, my jaw hit the globe. You know, that keeps them busy, shortens their lifespan, reduces the pensions, will be grand. That's, there's a darkness to the UBI idea. Mm. If it comes from 
people who wield massive capital and whose genuine hope in the world is oligopolistic concentrations of power and information at the very top. That's a really, really big problem. I, don't, I, 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 I think it's an interesting policy, um, but where it's been tried, yeah. and particularly in Finland, um, where it's been tried, uh, you know, they give kind of uh, uh, um, hospital consultants and, 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 and people like that, they gave them a UBI and they give other people a UBI. Mm. Where it's worked, it's had very mixed results. Um, so I would be uh, cautious about rolling this out and I would argue for more research. And could I be on the UBI list, please? Because that would be great. Um, I'm taking a few more audience questions. We've got about just over 10 minutes left at Stephen. So if you've got a question, send it via the app or feel free to put your hand up and we'll get a microphone over to you. Um, Stephen, what would a new deal between super and unions look like in reality? <clears throat> in reality, it would be a lobbying block. So uh, where, where um, there are instances where labour market regulations were being weakened by the current government or mm -hmm. a future government, uh, the super industry and the unions would work together where uh, it made sense to uh, study this properly. The, u the unions and the super industry would co-fund initiatives to actually produce new numbers. Um, typically, you don't argue against a number with an emotional appeal to some nostalgic past, you know, the Bob Hawke thing and all that kind of stuff, right? That's not a, that's not a good way to do this. You don't convince people at the RBA with uh, you know, notions about worker dignity and stuff. You, you don't. What you do is you show them that divergence between income and, and, and house prices, and you said they have to come together. Mm. And there's only two ways they come together. Either house prices fall, now this happened in Ireland, I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to have your house have in value. So I can tell you from personal and societal experience, you don't want the red line to go down. You don't want it to go up as much, but you don't want it to go down. The blue line is the thing you want to come up to meet. Um, and so how do you do that? The technology is through policy. And really, you have to start fighting one narrative with another. And that, that narrative has to come with numbers. Mm -hmm. And those numbers have to be generated by somebody, and those people enjoy being paid. Typically, so how are you going to how are you going to get, how are you going to make make that happen? So I would sponsor. I mean, you, you, you use ASI, use use a use a peak body or two peak bodies or whatever, um, to 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 sponsor these initiatives. And when you do that, you'll get some really good people. They'll produce some really interesting numbers. You might be able to change the narrative somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you'll also find is, you know, there are places in the policy making. Uh, system like the Fair Work Ombudsman and places like that that are literally tasked with this idea. Mm. So you'll find a, a, a very, um, a very welcome reception in certain areas of the policy uh, landscape. Um, and you know, frankly speaking, everyone's a worker. Right? Yeah. So I think what is interesting as well is that. In the current situation, I, I mean, I mentioned the point that you know Australian debt to GDP is 60 something percent. Um, you could increase that. You could borrow more from the rest of the world. Pretty low interest rates, not a bad idea. You could make you you could reduce income taxes. Just cut taxes. Super popular, right? Cut income taxes. But every time you do that, you make the government finances more fragile. So that would also get the same effect. Yeah. yeah. But again, who's that going to help? The mm. people at the very top. Yeah. Not the people at the very bottom. And this is the point I want to hit on, because you're talking about the red line going down and the blue line coming up, the yeah. red line being house prices and, of course, versus the blue line being wage growth. The fact of the matter is we've got predictions out there that house prices are going to fall. You, you yourself mentioned the Financial Times saying house prices are going to drop by mm. about 10%. And wage growth isn't going anywhere mm. in this country. So realistically, what's your outlook? So your, your outlook right now, so, oh, so, this is very important. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, if you hear somebody saying the words soft and landing and house prices, <laughs> there are only two things to do. Smile, back out the room, and whatever they're selling, short it. Because they're idiots. There is no such thing as a soft landing in house prices. House prices never land softly. That's not a thing. It's not a thing. If you're on a plane and the, and the pilot says, we're coming in for a soft landing, you're going to go, 
that's going to be okay. <laughs> now, to be fair, if they start talking about the landing, people will get a bit freaked out. But the reason the pilot, you have confidence in the pilot is A, they know what they're doing. B, they only have one stick that gets them up and down. And C, they have control over the levers on the plane. No one has control over the levers in the housing market, really. The, the analogy would be uh, uh, the RBA governor, uh, Governor Lowe, uh, on the back of the plane, hanging out the back with a flag, trying to use the flag to increase drag on the plane. That's, there are no wings on the plane. That's the analogy, right? This is an absolutely yeah. terrifying prediction of what's going to happen to house this prices. This is what happens to house prices everywhere. It just hasn't so happened in anybody's living memory here. So Everywhere. are you saying we're in yeah. for a hard landing then? No, no. So I, I'm saying where house prices fall, yeah. they do not fall in a soft way. Mm. It's not possible. They, it's not possible because there's an expectational component. If anybody's interested in this, there's two books that you should, or two uh, things to read. One is a book by a guy called Hyman Minsky from 1986 called Stabilizing an Unstable Economy. And the other is by, uh, uh, by uh, 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 a guy called Moritz Schulerich from Germany. He produced a... Uh, 200-year history of house price movements. Mm. Uh, so S C H U R L A R S C K. Um, he produced um, uh, an amazing history of 200 years of house price movements. There are no soft landings. So that's the first thing. Anybody who says soft landing, walk away. The second thing is have a look at have a look at how things are. Now, the, it, it, pe people who predict these things, what they're predicting is credit growth will slow. Mm. Right, so the banks aren't releasing credit into the system, which is making it harder for people to get mortgages, which is making it harder for people to buy houses, mm -hmm. which is reducing the growth of house prices. So that's a really important point. We're not talking about the absolute value of house prices going down. Yeah. We're just saying you don't get stupid money anymore. That's all that they're saying. And the idea is that the regulator Plus the banks, there, there's already been one bank in, in, increase its interest rates above the, mm. the, the level, will actually act together to control the system and stop that house price growth going ridiculously high. If that's true, let's say that's true, then what that means is that line, rather than growing like that, grows like this. There's still a divergence. Yeah. Still the, 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 the unsustainable process is still there. Mm. It, it, it just means that they've kept house prices uh, 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 contained, and if they can do that, then you have to ask yourself, why didn't they do it before? Mm. Right? Why do you have two teachers in Melbourne with a million dollars in debt? That's not a good thing, you know? The other piece of the puzzle is, of course, wage growth. And we've got a question mm. here saying that do we need a complete rethink around distribution of taxes and, and what we tax and how we tax it? Yeah, I think, I think, I think you should. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the important things is that the structure of the economy has changed. Mm. So uh, if you think about where... The idea of a tax is that you levy it on where the value is created, essentially. So my income is taxed. I create value as a worker. My income is taxed. Mm. Um, I, uh, I, have a, I have some capital appreciation. That capital gain is taxed. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I die. <laughs> My death is taxed, right? Um, where's the value being created in this economy? It's in services, um, but it's also uh, in the digital sphere. So uh, we have to figure out how to tax information. Um, can I suggest poorly spelt text messages? <laughs> if we just taxed those, your problems are solved. <laughs> figure out how to do that, folks, and it'll all work out. Or badly, badly phrased emails. <laughs> text those. Hi, what come up in exam? <laughs> <laughs> Not a vowel in there. Yeah. I've got a few more questions to get through in only three minutes, so we've got to run okay. through these. Um, is our political instability having a material impact on Australia's economic outcome? No. Or, okay, great, brilliant. Um, so it's just a sideshow then, is it? It, 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 is a, it is a remarkable degree to which it doesn't matter. Okay. That's because you have very strong institutions underneath your political system, um, which were put there by this, in the 70s and 80s by really, really visionary people. Um, when, when, when the economy needed them to be put in. The same leadership needs to be shown now. How do we fix intergenerational inequality? Great question. Mm -hmm. Land taxes. Land taxes. Side value, land taxes. Uh, it's, a, it's an old idea. It goes back to a guy called Henry George. Um, and the basic idea is, have all this stuff. It's a big asset. 
You, it, it's the largest asset class in, in, in the economy, even with super industry. You have to think about side value taxes. That would, that would be the way. I, I, I disagree with debt taxes, actually, because it's essentially a roll of the dice as to whether you can afford to pay them. Um, above, I mean, ab above a certain level. You know, if you're, if you, at the, at, at the moment, uh, in, in, I, I live in Coburg, and at the moment, you know, the ha house prices are, are up to the point where people are practically catapulting their relatives out of these houses. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> no, they're like, you'll be grand, you'll be grand, you know, and she just, off she flies. And I think that's, the, the, it is, yeah, it is the thing. So, um, yeah, I would, um, I would, uh, Look at that carefully. Okay. Should super boards engage with the companies they own on the issue of wages? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great super board, again, I don't think, a bit like uh, Australia not realizing how big it is or how small it is, um, I don't think the super industry realizes how powerful it is. It's incredibly powerful. You just haven't used it. Uh, and I think you've been scared to use it. And I think. It, working, with, working with unions to increase wages will not be unpopular, mm. you know? Okay. A last question from Karen. She says, Australia also has a strong history of public institutions, which we are eroding without talking about that. What are your views on this? I think Australia's public institutions are amazing. Um, I agree that they are being eroded. And the reason that they're being eroded is we do not have a, a language anymore for the expression of public value. We don't have an expression of public value. Compare, so you want to buy a toothbrush on Amazon, right? You know how to do that. But, or you, want to, you have to pick a high school for your kids. Both are choices. They're very, very different choices, aren't they? Really, really different choices. Um, and the, 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 the state mediates through one of them, mm. and we don't have a really good way of describing the public value that these things generate. Um, and that's because we don't have a coherent narrative about it yeah. yet, and we also don't have a good way to measure public value anymore. We used to, um, uh, but uh, I think we can get it back. There's nothing new under the sun. And I'm, very, I'm actually, despite all the gloom and doom, I'm actually very, very optimistic about Australia. I, I really do love it here. So how are you feeling after a year in Australia going back home? I'm, I'm quite excited. I'm quite excited. I, I, I leave on October the 4th, and uh, I start teaching on October the 8th. So God help the students in Limerick. <laughs> you know, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, hopefully I'll make some sense. Um, but yeah, it'll be really good to go home, but I'm coming back in July and August next year as a senior fellow at the University of Melbourne. So, you know, I get to enjoy the Melbourne summer in <laughs> July. It's superb. No, but, 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 but again, I'm, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to be here. And we're really grateful that you came. Thank you so much for joining Thank you. us. Cheers. Dr. Stephen Kinsella, please. Thank you.